everybody. We are at 2.30, the start of an exciting CNI. So thank you all for coming. Um, little ground rule, this uh, session is being recorded. Now, you won't be recorded, but we're being recorded. And what that means is that we uh, are bound a little bit uh, to this general tabling area so that we're recorded. Um, so we may not be as animated as, as you would normally find us, uh, but we'll yeah. do our best. Puts a whole damper on the interpretive dance portion of our presentation. It does. It does. And I know that you were looking forward to that. Um, I'm Scott Walter. I'm the university librarian at DePaul University, and I'm joined today by... I am Janice Scurrio. I am the information technology librarian at DePaul University. And the third person on our, uh, on our program, Megan Bernal, who's one of our associate university librarians, uh, wasn't able to join us today, so, uh, but she's represented here, in the, certainly in the process. We'd like to start by just saying thank you, really, to all of the folks who did makerspace programs at CNI over the last few years because it was those programs that really helped us to realize how important it was to shoehorn a makerspace into the most recent phase of our library renovation. And if you heard Joan speaking just a few moments ago uh, about the role of creativity in the curriculum and the role of spaces like these in uh, bridging the gaps between the curriculum and the co-curriculum, you actually uh, heard her singing a, a lot of the same songs that we sang on campus. We would like to focus today as you'll see, not necessarily on the specifics of the spaces we'll describe in terms of their technology or their staffing program or what have you, but really more about the approach that we took in, again, I think doing exactly what Joan was talking about, trying to build the makerspace as part of larger university uh, perspectives and initiatives, especially around uh, innovation, entrepreneurship, and community engagement. And you'll see those themes, I think, throughout uh, our presentation today. And our hope is that by talking about it in that context, what we're laying the groundwork for is uh, a stronger argument for academic library maker spaces as a strategic investment in campus programs and partnerships that are designed to promote that sort of innovation and teaching and learning and scholarship again that we've already heard about today. Now if people do want to talk about technical details we will be happy to do that in the Q&A and you'll get a little taste of them in the presentation. So, you want to do? Oh, go ahead. So we've got five slides from the maker community around DePaul as well as in Chicago. So uh, in the upper left-hand corner, uh, we've got some people working with 3D printers from the Coleman Entrepreneur uh, uh, Center. And uh, over to the right, uh, you see yours truly working with two students uh, in the Maker Hub. Uh, below that photo, uh, we have the STEAM Lab from DePaul College Prep. A, uh, a school that we work very closely with. To the left is the Maker Lab at the Harold Washington Library in downtown Chicago. And in the center, oh, what's in the center? It's the uh, IRL. Oh, yeah, that is the IRL. That's a very small photo. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that is actually our complementary space uh, in the loop, on the Loop campus, uh, the Idea Realization Lab, or the IRL in short and we will talk a little bit about them later on. Yeah, and so again, we've really tried to, to um, center uh, our maker hub within the library with a real understanding of the broader maker community uh, in the city of Chicago. And we'd also like to present something of a counterpoint to something that we've experienced, maybe you've experienced. We've seen in the literature and we've heard it when we've talked to people about why to make the investment in maker spaces. Uh, this is from Barbara Pfister. Uh, Barbara Pfister, who I, I love and am friends with, sometimes uses 3D printer as a, um, as a shorthand for fads in academic libraries. Uh, and often, and you'll see in her in her columns and so on, sort of a little bit of a of a nudge uh, against maker spaces and around three D printing, and 
in addition to sometimes associating it with the idea of fadism, in this presentation she, taught, she seemed to counterpoint the idea of investing in, in emerging technology and in maker spaces with a social conscience. And I think hopefully what you'll see is that certainly at DePaul we don't see those things as being opposed in any way at all. And we did encounter this sense of fadism or the broader question of how are you pushing the limits of what we are comfortable in thinking and planning for in terms of library space and the library's technology program even from some of our colleagues on campus. I had to do a lot of advocacy and justification for the presence of 3D printers as well as other experimental technologies in the library. Yeah, and, and, and that was especially, you know, with our campus information technology and our campus facilities operations who were working with us on this renovation and were really pressed to think about this as a core component of a library renovation as opposed to some other sort of, of campus project. And we do want to talk a little bit about why we chose the name Maker Hub for the library's makerspace as opposed to makerspace or maker lab or something cute that might have been drawn from Chicago's industrial history, which would certainly be possible. I think the stockyard was one name we threw Yes, away. yeah, but turns out that has some negative connotations. Um, <laughs> But what we want to, while well, we'll talk about the hub and spokes in terms of the maker spaces, and you saw them a second ago, Chicago Public, the K-12 schools, the Idea Realization Lab, we're also really thinking about these spokes going out to academic programs. Uh, and you'll see connections uh, when we talk today to um, in faculty development programs out of the provost's office, our office of teaching and learning and assessment, our student affairs programs, our liberal studies programs. So we want to think about it really as a hub, not just of maker spaces within the city, but of this really emerging uh, focus on, again, as Joan said, creativity in the curriculum. All right, and here are our spaces as they are. So above is the Maker Hub itself, located at the DePaul University Library. Uh, I was a part of the planning team. I am also the lab manager. I run a staff of two student workers and myself. Uh, so that is uh, who runs the, the Maker Hub. At the bottom is our complimentary space, uh, a space that was planned in tandem with ours, uh, actually very coincidentally. Uh, the Idea Realization Lab, uh, which is run by a very prominent member of the Chicago Maker community. Uh, and we'll get a little bit into that later. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's some other uh, maker spaces uh, on campus. Like I mentioned before, uh, the Coleman Center's uh, Maker Lab. Uh, also too, we've got, what else do we have here? Oh, we've got the Art Museum, um, the School of Music, and the School of Theater. They all have kind of their own pop-up maker spaces. Uh, so the huge problem with having these spaces kind of siloed off is that they're very restrictive to students that are enrolled in those specific programs. Uh, before the Maker Hub and the IRL opened, there was really no place for the entire university community to meet and have access to this sort of technology. So uh, yeah, uh, we're very proud to offer those services uh, uh, to, to pretty much the entire university. Yeah, and I think in addition to that universal accessibility that probably all of you understand, <clears throat> the other thing that I think we were able to bring to this, and it's the nature of librarians, right? We, mm -hmm. we bring people together and we make connections. There were all these little things that were popping up there were 3D printers in business. There were 3D printers in the basement of the physics department. There were making like activities yeah, in theater. They were building sets uh, in the art museum. But there wasn't that discussion of really looking at it across campus, um, as we'll talk about. And there wasn't the framework for people to come together to talk right. about these things. Everyone was doing it in isolation. Um, and in addition to building that space, what we've really tried to focus on building these past few months is those 
uh, set of connections from people who are otherwise right. from that separate. Uh, interdisciplinary kind of structure we wanted to bring uh, someone who works um, in the basement of Burn Hall uh, which is where the uh, physics office is and someone who works in the art department which is in an entirely different building altogether they may never cross paths otherwise uh, but we've actually had people meet in the maker hub uh, and collaborate people who would never talk to each other uh, otherwise and that's pretty cool so with that as, as uh, introduction, I wanted to turn for a second and just tell a little bit about DePaul so people understand, um, again, sort of our framework. So um, <clears throat> DePaul is, uh, among other things, the largest Catholic university in the United States. This infographic gives you a little bit of sense of, of the program, um, the size of the program, about 300 different undergraduate and graduate degree programs. and. Um, and a real focus, as we'll see, on again on the community. Our student body is highly diverse. Again, one of the reasons why maybe I pinged uh, Barbara's comment uh, about uh, being engaged with low-income communities. We are a, a very highly diverse um, student body in terms of ethnicity, race, uh, in terms of socioeconomic status, and uh, one that is committed to community engagement, not just as part of our mission, but really in thinking about our enrollment management strategy. And again, thinking about, as we'll, we'll talk about this notion of really thinking about making across the lifespan, uh, we're really beginning to see that in the city, uh, and knowing that that was the, uh, the case, and knowing, again, the nature of our enrollment strategy was part of our thinking about how to develop the program. One of the other things that DePaul prides itself on is its innovation, especially its innovative approaches to teaching and learning and its continuing commitment to its mission. So, and when DePaul talks about innovation, it usually highlights a few key points that were relevant to us in thinking about the, the Maker Hub. Uh, rapid development of academic programs, uh, developing those programs in the context of community partnerships and investing strategically in spaces and services and staff required to support the faculty and students in those campus uh, in those <coughs> programs and we've been happy that over the last few years especially as part of our renovation work um, we've started to see uh, senior leadership of the university include the library in their discussions of what it looks like to be innovative at the university. So for us, that's a real win. That was a discussion going on at the university that in years past wouldn't have highlighted the library. Uh, as we'll see, that approach to innovation also ha presents some planning challenges. So within that, in that's the institutional context. We also wanted to give you a quick sense of the renovation process. So this work was done as part of an ongoing four-phase renovation of the Richardson Library. Um, phase one in 2011, phase two in 2013, phase three just this past fall in 2017. And we're not going to get in phase four, I should say, TBA. Uh, <laughs> we're working on it. Uh, <laughs> And we're not going to get into the details of the renovation today. Uh, if people have questions, we're happy to answer them. And if people want to see how the Maker Hub sort of sits within the context of the broader fa this phase of the renovation, I did bring a little handout that you can look at if you'd like uh, after the after the session. Um, I think the key thing to remember, and the thing that we wanted to highlight in talking about the renovation, was that especially in phase two and phase three, we really did look to inform the renovation process and the programs that were developed or brought into the library as part of the renovation uh, with a clear focus on collaboration across campus, engagement with those campus partners, and uh, thinking intentionally about strategic initiatives identified by the university and the way in which the renovation uh, and new staff, new services would help to move those initiatives forward. Cool. I'm just going to talk a little bit about my baby, uh, the Maker Hub. 
the Maker Hub softly opened on September 6, 2017. And when I mean a soft opening, it only opened with two pieces of functioning equipment. So one thing I'd like to quickly mention is that technology is great, but it's also man-made. It's prone to break early and often. So be prepared to identify common <coughs> issues and a quick course of action to resolve them. So uh, while we were planning the space, uh, we were really meaning for it to be uh, an entry level space uh, where uh, students who were working on class projects as well as extracurricular projects would feel uh, equally as welcome. So uh, after some negotiation, ego negotiation with our facilities people and our architectural planning team, we were given a 500 square foot space which is smaller than my first studio apartment in grad school. Uh, given this constraint, we had to make an executive decision on the focus of our space as this made our equipment selection very limited. We wanted to utilize each area, no square foot left behind. Uh, we wanted a diverse array of equipment, uh, but we knew we'd need to have a more entry level space, meaning that we'd have equipment with a relatively low learning curve and a low training curve as well. Uh, from a staffing perspective, we kind of knew that our staffing model uh, would be pretty skeletal. So uh, we wanted equipment that didn't really require supervision as it's less dangerous as say an industrial CNC router or a drill press. Uh, so the whole idea was to offer a learning environment that wasn't intimidating to use with friendly staff people uh, willing to assist and consult as needed. Um, looking at other academic library maker spaces, uh, we noticed a trend uh, supporting not just curriculum, uh, but like I mentioned before, also supporting uh, personal interests as well. And so uh, to our surprise, uh, we found a growing user base for 3D modeling and product design prototyping um, with Fab Labs. Many undergraduates are being taught concepts of 3D modeling uh, with CAD programs such as Tinkercad, sometimes as early as elementary school. Uh, students make these 3D models in school, then realizing that they can make these creations come to life using a 3D printer. And as these students enter college, they're not only used to prototyping technology such as 3D printers, but they almost expect them especially as they make their choices as to which higher education institution uh, to attend. So one thing I'd also like to point out that the Maker Hub uh, is a lab. It is a maker lab, but it's also a classroom. Uh, we'll also get into that a little bit more later on. Uh, but otherwise, we've got three 3D printers currently, uh, one 3D scanner. Uh, we have a sewing machine, a bunch of hand tools, uh, drills, wrenches, cutters, saws, uh, typical things that you'd find in your dad's garage. And we also have a baby CNC router. It's about yay big. Uh, most of our students use it for cutting things, uh, wood. Uh, we haven't uh, had it used for any other extensive projects other than like carving, but hopefully that will change once more people know about it. Mm -hmm. Am I also yeah, talking yeah, about yeah, the IRL? Okay. <laughs> So I talked a little bit more about the IRL, or the Idea Realization Lab. Uh, so the IRL is kind of like our big sibling, uh, located on the Loop campus, a short uh, half hour train ride. Is it about a half hour? It's about a half so. hour train yeah. ride. <laughs> Cool, uh, in downtown Chicago. Uh, so coincidentally, both our space and the IRL uh, were planned and were scheduled to open in tandem. So the Library Maker Hub and the IRL, like real life siblings, have many things in common but are still very different. So uh, the IRL's lab manager, uh, Jay Margulis, uh, he's a, a great person who already operates a hacker space, maker space in the South Chicago suburbs. And so uh, he's a prominent figure in the Chicago maker community, and so he brought his experience with running a full-scale maker and hacker space with the intention of being a space on campus that would be access accessible to all students, regardless of program enrollment, a concept that was completely absent on our campus before our spaces opened. So Jay's vision included an unstructured learning environment staffed with knowledgeable people available to offer guidance to people interested in making, not necessarily for classroom projects. Sound familiar? The concept of the hub means that if someone has a project that outgrows the scope of what we can support at the library's makerspace, uh, we'd send them here. They have more equipment, more consumables, more space, more staffing, more storage, and that's perfectly okay. These spaces are meant to complement, not compete. And by planning uh, 
to acquire similar materials by working together on uh, training programs and certification programs and some of the legal um, uh, protocols in regards to waivers and so on. It really is designed to let people move seamlessly between the two spaces. So if you are trained and certified on, you know, on a printer or a router or what have you, in our space, to the degree that that same tool is being used downtown, you can just move that straight on. Now obviously again, uh, when you get to downtown, they actually have more things, larger things, more dangerous things. Um, but we are trying to plan them together and working, uh, especially with OGC, uh, uh, General Counsel, to make sure again that this really sort of new new set of activities on campus that had never really occurred before uh, would be understood by the people who would have to sign off on them legally and, uh, and yeah. so on. Lots of meetings with lawyers. Lots of meetings with lawyers. <laughs> you never think about that when you're building a makerspace. We had a lot of meetings with, with general counsel about making sure that this was going to be safe and secure and everyone would understand what the requirements were. Uh, we're not talking about Space Lab. This is Jay Margulis's, um down uh, South Chicago makerspace it's enormous um, but we wanted again to just for those who were interested in it you could see what space lab looks like and it did provide some of the seed ideas for the IRL um, but another important thing that again we learned as part of our planning was that we learned that it wasn't just Jay, there were other people around campus, not in libraries, not in information technology, uh, in different parts of the university who had been involved for the last few years in some of these community-based um, fab labs and maker spaces. And they were really excited about bringing it to campus. And, you know, these sort of makerspace veterans were, you know, they, were, they helped us in the planning. They said, well, you need to have this kind of certification program. You need to think about this uh, if you're gonna have volunteers or in our case, student employees. Um, and it was, so it was a design, again, that, that is very reflective of DePaul's character uh, in that we really looked to design our spaces in a way um, that learned from um, the experience in the larger maker community. So there was uh, an active community in the city and there were people active in that community in the university and in the library and, and that was good. But there were also a number of obstacles. Now we're not going to talk about these obstacles in depth uh, both because of time and because you're probably familiar with most of them. Uh, I don't believe any of them are unique uh, to us. I would say uh, as I suggested earlier, that there's some truth to that uh, old saying about living by the sword and dying by the sword. Um, DePaul's approach to innovation is one that prizes rapid planning and implementation, and that has been beneficial to us in the past, and it was beneficial to the development of both the Maker Hub and the Idea Realization Lab. But it also meant that both were designed very quickly. They iterated on the run. Mm -hmm. um, and we did have to do a lot of work to bring campus-wide, as I said earlier, campus-wide groups like information services and facility operations sort of into the fold in thinking about library space in this way. And we had to do it uh, in, a, in an ex a model, a budget model that, as I'm sure you're all familiar with, included no new money for any of these things. And since this was such an entirely new concept on campus, uh, we had to deal with a lot of ambiguity, especially with our external uh, IT support, uh, namely uh, kind of determining which things would be uh, covered, which things wouldn't. Uh, and yeah, we're still kind of <coughs> trying to fish things and, f and feel things out to this day. Uh, yes, we are still feeling things out. <laughs> uh, we're gonna talk again, I'm. Uh, noticing the time and want to make sure we have time for questions. So I'm going to breeze through this piece just to talk a little bit about these are some of the opportunities that came in these first few months in terms of making those connections across campus. Um, our teaching commons, we'll see that in a moment, our Studio Chi Digital Scholarship Center, um, some of the other initiatives. We'd rather talk about them in particular rather than um, outline them. The one I did want to make sure we mentioned briefly was this DePaul Makes, which was essentially sort of a, a, a grassroots network 
of, of uh, people working around the university in academic departments and student affairs and the library and IT and the, who had an interest in this and have sort of um, worked to build uh, essentially a campus-wide network looking at uh, the design and implementation of maker technology and the integration of maker technology into the curriculum in the absence of a formal structure. There never was a formal structure for it. We've built it themse uh, ourselves uh, and uh, Janice has been the key person in the library for that. Let's go ahead and talk about some of the programs. Absolutely. So uh, the smiling gentleman in the photo uh, is the uh, the mastermind behind uh, the DePaul Makes Movement. His name is Dr. Eric Landall. He is a fac faculty member from the physics department. Uh, so he helps uh, staff open hours. He also holds um, uh, tons of workshops uh, for faculty looking to integrate uh, maker technology uh, in curriculum. So he's a big proponent of the maker movement, uh, especially in Chicago. He's very passionate about DIY, um, so especially making simple electronics, uh, Arduino. Uh, also, too, uh, he taught me how to solder. I had no idea how to solder before I met Eric. So, um, yeah, definitely cool guy to work with. So uh, he taught the wildly popular teaching in a makerspace workshop, um, it, which wasn't just open to DePaul faculty, but also higher ed professionals from all over Chicago, uh, which was pretty cool. Yeah. So this is one th feature we wanted to uh, make sure was highlighted. Uh, part of what Eric did, in addition to being our maker in residence uh, this year in the Maker Hub, he did develop this workshop that was delivered as part of the Teaching and Learning Certificate Program through DePaul's uh, Office of Teaching, Learning, and Assessment. That um, I think he did a he did two workshops: one in Lincoln Park, one in our downtown Loop campus, full. Uh, in both cases mm -hmm. and has brought uh, oh more than 30 faculty members from departments all around the col uh, all around the university through the maker hub specifically to talk to them about how you might use uh, 3d printing and other maker technologies in your courses uh, and if, again if you want to see a little bit more about what that workshop uh, how it was described you can see the link right here Ooh. Another thing that Eric and Janice will be doing uh, next year is a first year uh, seminar. So this is, going to, this is going to go in the fall as part of our Chicago Quarter. Um, some of you have heard me talk about Chicago Quarter before. It's our first year seminar program. All incoming students at DePaul take a class in their first quarter about the city of Chicago. Uh, and it can be anything. It can be about music, it can be architecture, it can be politics, it can be Al Capone, uh, it can be anything. There's over a hundred of these classes offered uh, in the fall quarter. And a key component of those courses is that they actually get you out into the community. So you're actually you know, in the city and you're going to places and meeting with people. And so uh, Eric has uh, proposed this course, it's going to be called um, what did they say Dave? it's going to be called here? Uh, the Maker Movement in Chicago. The Maker yeah. Movement in Chicago. And so he'll be taking, not only will they be using the Maker Hub and the Idea Realization Lab, but they'll actually be going to different maker spaces around the city of Chicago and learning about the Maker Movement and the DIY movement and, and doing that as part of their introduction to the university. Uh, so this we think is going to be really, really interesting. Oh, and then again, because we we talked a little bit about instruction, we're talking about this idea of the makerspace as um, as a classroom. We did want to talk very briefly about the work that we've just really started uh, in thinking about how to integrate uh, student learning outcomes into the use of the makerspace. So this is uh, a strong focus at DePaul over the years. We have developed undergraduate information literacy learning outcomes. We have recently, over the last couple of years, been working on primary source literacy in terms of our instruction in special collections and archives. And so again, it was natural once we launched the Makerspace for Janice to begin working with our instruction team to think about the question of what is learned uh, in a Makerspace. And um, this uh, Austin Community College example was one example she found of student learning outcomes associated with makerspace use. 
uh, and this sort of, of, of creativity curriculum, if you will. But it's something that we're really just beginning to explore, again, not just within the library's instructional program, but thinking about our work with, um, you know, with the art museum, with student affairs, with uh, the faculty members who work through the Office of Teaching, Learning, and Assessment to um, do their own work on student learning outcomes. So I think it's going to be very exciting, uh, hopefully within the next year or so. Is that a little about the programs? Oh, um, yeah, this program uh, was a program put on by the Institute of, for Business and Professional Ethics, which is a department of the Department of Philosophy, which talked a little bit about uh, some of the ethical issues uh, surrounding uh, 3D printing, um, say these make-it-yourself physical spaces, and uh, yeah, they also uh, demoed 3D printing. Actually, it was me. I was the one who demoed 3D printing <laughs> during this uh, during this <coughs> workshop. And uh, they just spoke a little bit more about um, being a little more mindful of uh, some of the, um, the potential repercussions of the maker movement. And I think one interesting thing they addressed is uh, waste. Uh, which I thought was really interesting since in our lab in particular, uh, we recycle all 3D printed failed prints. We have a fail pail uh, directly next to our 3D printers. And I think in the six months we've been opened, uh, the fail pail is like maybe yay big. So it's like, like maybe three feet wide and maybe like one foot high, so not very big. And so uh, we also invite students to take things out of the fail pail and build new things out of them. So kind of creating like Franken creations out of other people's <laughs> failed prints. So really uh, nothing really goes to waste in the Maker Hub. Uh, but it's still good to be mindful and to think about some of <coughs> these uh, potential repercussions uh, as uh, we, we make things in our lab. Yeah, and what we've really seen, again, in just the few months we've been open is that programs that had not been engaged with the library in the past are coming in. Um, you know, physics, <laughs> I don't know if there'd ever been a library instruction class for physics. Uh, and now we're literally, you know, we're teaching physics mm -hmm. classes in the library, uh, right. in the makerspace. Um, the, the engagement with that entrepreneurial initiative across the university and having a center for it on the Lincoln Park campus as opposed to our downtown Loop campus where it has been historically centered has brought um, business programs again into the library in a way mm -hmm. that we hadn't seen before and there have been great um, downstream uh, impact as well so not only are we having pro public programs like this um, which is a, a, a collaboration between physics sorry uh, philosophy and business but the Coleman Entrepreneurship Center started sending its uh, startup advisors uh, to our learning commons so we were at we were adding startup advising to the programs the tutoring programs uh, that and the peer uh, assistance programs that we were offering through the learning commons again something that never would have happened if they hadn't seen us as being contributing to uh, to the entrepreneurial initiatives across campus so very exciting and then we want to end and then turn over to questions by just talking again about this community engagement idea and sort of coming full circle to that that charge uh, that I suggested early on that investment in um, maker technology or 3d printing might somehow suggest that you were not engaged with the community uh, in Chicago, at least, uh, that is certainly not uh, the case. Maker technology is something that is increasingly available across the lifespan and across the educational and cultural heritage community. Uh, K-12 schools, academic libraries, public libraries, school libraries, museums, all are either have or are building maker capacity. And the reality is, is my experience <laughs> as the father of a Chicago public school student uh, was really instrumental in sort of opening my eyes to how important this was because uh, my daughter's first experience with 3D printing was in fourth grade uh, in, a, in an entrepreneurial program uh, co-sponsored by Chicago Public and Northwestern University. And as we were touring high schools around the city last year, I got firsthand, you know, I was able to see firsthand how many high schools had this, 
mm -hmm. had some component of a maker space or a computer lab that had been outfitted to do critical making or some kind of um, modeling. And it became very clear to me that we were going to be far less competitive for some of our core students coming out of Chicago public schools if the technology available to them in college was not as good as the technology available to them in their high school. Uh, or, again, we are a very diverse city and there are many high schools that do not have access to these tools in their schools. But the Chicago Public Library has done incredible work in bringing uh, maker technology and media content creation mm. to youth services. Shout out to UMedia. UMedia, uh, some of you may be familiar with the Chicago Public Library. You may not know that it was designed collaboratively with DePaul uh, originally, the College of Computing and Digital Media. And again, for those of you who are our local aficionados, you know that uh, UMedia's most famous alumnus, Chance the Rapper, uh, continues to be uh, an advocate both of public schools and of libraries in the city. But what we saw was really the emergence of certainly a K-20 maker community. And we also saw that more and more of our students were looking to move into sort of a, a, a lifelong engagement with maker technology through the programs that were available either through Chicago Public or community-based programs like Space Lab. And so in thinking about that, it really helped us to think about not just the approach we were going to take to it, but the connections we were going to be sure to make. And so we do try to build in these connections with the community, uh, with our public library, with the Chicago maker community. And again, even with some of the things you don't think of as a maker community, um, like our film school's connection with Cinespace Chicago. If you watch any of the Chicago Fire, Chicago PD, that's Cinespace. Uh, that's where the, those things are being done. One quick uh, thing I'd like to also mention about uh, lifelong learning. Um, we are also open to alumni which at first I thought was kind of a revolutionary idea, uh, but uh, there are a couple of academic maker spaces that also open their doors to alumni as well. Uh, the University of Illinois at Chicago is one. Um, there's us, and I think that's pretty much it. But again, uh, to kind of support that uh, pursuit of lifelong learning, uh, coming back to uh, DePaul and kind of um, spreading your knowledge, maker knowledge, as even after you leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So it's been a busy six months, mostly for Janice. <laughs> uh, but yeah. we're excited about where we're going. And again, we think these connections are helpful in, in building ongoing support for this growing part of uh, the libraries program and the campus technology program. And with that, we'll throw it open to questions.